Okay, guy. And Mark, can you hear me? Okay. I sure can. Awesome. I like oh, to I thank you guys. Wait, I lost you. Oh, please tell me you're kidding. I'm fucking with you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I have your, I can't, I just, great. I'm nervous enough as it is. Uh, okay, uh, first I want to start with some data because a lot of people on this call are data driven. Good. And we helped with a survey that was released a few days ago. And we asked the question whether you felt excellent, good, not so good, or poor about several attributes. The job security, 35% said either not so good or poor. Second, even worse, 42% felt not so good or poor about the rate of their finances. Third was their savings, and it's 56% not so good or poor. And the worst of all is the cost of living. 66% of Americans feel not so good or poor about the shape of cost of living in this country. Are they right to be that nervous? They should be more nervous. Tell me really why. Um, because we don't know what it's going to look like on the other side. And so you can just do some basic mental gymnastics. You know, when we get to the other side and we start to open things up, people are, are going to have this six week, whatever it is, experience where, or eight week or 12 weeks where they're questioning whether or not they want to do what they did before. You know, so if companies say we're open, the, their employees are going to say, do I want to come back? Right. Is this the job I wanted? If you worked for a, a bar as a bartender, are you going to want to go back? If you worked um, in the events business doing weddings, do you want that risk factor coming back? If you worked in an office building and you weren't happy with your job, do you want to come back? So that's on one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation are the employers, and they're thinking, all right, I have uncertainty, but where I don't have uncertainty is I was just able to have all these people working from home, and I got X, Y, and Z done probably more efficiently. Am I going to hire the same number of people back? Am I going to hire the same type of people? Am I going to let them work in the office building or work at home? And so you're going to have this in equilibrium, if that's a word, where things aren't matched up. And that's going to create more uncertainty. And that's going to, think, I think, in the short term, have negative consequences for the economy. So that's really bad news for the real estate industry. But I would assume that most people would want their jobs back. Maybe not. I don't know. I, I think there'll be, there'll be uncertainty and fear, obviously, about wanting to pay their bills. Um, but at the same time, you've got all that time where you've, you've got to think and you just were in an industry potentially that was decimated. And there's always the risk of this virus coming back or us being impacted in some way. You know, and you've got that recency bias that this could happen again. So are you going to want to go back to that job as a bartender? And then you've got the element of who's going outside and who's not going outside. Who thinks it's safe? Who doesn't think it's safe? Who's confident going into group settings and who's not? You know, are restaurants going to be the same? Not for a while. If you work in the airline industry, it's not going to be the same for a while. So you're not going to just go right back to your job if you think you might lose it again, or you think the amount of uncertainty um, about your job has increased dramatically. You're going to look for a different job, you know? And so you, and those jobs that you look at in, you know, America 2.0, who know, you know, they could be completely different than what they are now. So how do we get, I mean, you're one of the most optimistic guys I know, and I don't know if you're optimistic about the situation that we're in, but if I were to put you in charge of USA 2.0, what would you say to people right now to prepare them to going back to work, to prepare them to going back outside? Well, before I even talk to them, I'd be asking a lot of questions of business people and of individuals to find out where their heads are at. You know, so for my businesses, I'm probably not going to need as many people as I did before because I don't have to take up physical space the way I did before. You know, I don't I can communicate more easily um, using Zoom, you know, experiences like this um, than we did before. There's just different challenges. I'm going to talk to restaurants and 
service businesses and find out what they think is going to happen. Maybe there's so much pent up demand for weddings that they think that the wedding business is going to be great and they'll just have them in wide open spaces. I don't know. These are the questions that I have to have answered before I go talk to the American people because, I, like I said earlier, I don't think the supply and demand in the job market is going to go back to where it was. And that could be a positive thing because that could push us towards you know, better solutions. And I also think employees are going to expect a lot more. You know, in those certain um, in those circumstances where the employers are like, I got to get back because remember, very few are doing well. And even with the stimulus um, programs, they're going to be hurting for cash at some level or concerned about their cash flow at some level. And they're going to want to ignite their businesses as quickly as possible. And so how they do that and how they relate to their employees and how they hire their employees back will, will have a huge impact on whether they're successful or not. And on the other side of the equation, if I'm an employee and my, my prior employer who just laid me off, you know, two months, three months ago, whatever it is, wants me back, I'm going to feel like I have a whole lot more leverage. And so what do I do there? So if I'm going to take you even deeper, there are some people who've said to me that because we don't have to pay our rents for a couple months, because we don't have to pay our mortgages, because... We're getting some sort of a loan forgiveness and even credit card companies are acknowledging that people aren't going to pay on time. Are you at all nervous? You're a businessman. Are you at all nervous that we are creating a behavior that says if we get into trouble, we no longer have to pay our debts? Not really, because this was a life or death situation for so many people. I think um, people realize that it's atypical. Um, I don't think it, I'm, I'm not a big believer in that the the perspective that if you just give people money, they'll just get lazy and stay lazy. I, I still think people are going to want some fulfillment in their lives. I just think they're going to be more judicious in how and where they look for it and what they expect in return from their employer. What about the idea that we're getting checks and I'm still watching TV and I see, see these ads for Lexus and for uh, Mercedes, and I'm thinking, who's going to want to go out and buy an expensive car when right now we are sheltered in place? We don't know when this is going to end. The whole country's psyche, and I've got a couple more numbers for you, but the psyche is deteriorated. If we're not going to buy it, why are we trying to sell it? Well, if you think the economy is coming back at some point, whether it's six months, 12 months, 24 months, and you're a brand that wants to take advantage of the fact that rates are a lot lower, and you could afford it, it's not a bad time to advertise just, you know, just to be an aspirational brand or whatever, however you define your brand. So I don't think it's a bad time to advertise because not, not all advertising is transactional. So let me ask you, I'm going to give you some numbers here. Not only everybody looks at approval ratings, I want to give you the disapproval ratings. And at the top is Donald Trump. Strongly disapproved, not somewhat, but strongly, 51% of the country, half, followed by the media at 43%. Mike Pence at 39%. Trump ought to note that if he has any doubt about whether he should replace him or not. Congress at 36% strongly disapproved. The drug companies, 28% strongly disapproved. And this is their handling of the virus. Cuomo, only 21%. And Anthony Fauci, just 3%. That's my guy. <laughs> Why does Trump seem to push him aside when he's the most popular person in America today, the most credible, the person that people trust the most? How would you imagine he would push him aside? Because that's who he is, right? There is only one champ. There's only one superstar. There's only one person dominating the ratings, and that's Donald Trump. You know, and that's who, who he's been forever. And that's who he'll always be. That's just his approach. It's worked for him. Why would he change it? So we're getting questions right now that are coming up on the side of your screen. And the one that I enjoy the most, I'm going to give you, like, I'm going to wave a magic wand and you're now president of the United States. And you've been pretty critical of Trump. You told a few jokes at his expense, as uh -huh. have I. I'm putting you on that stage. Who are you putting around you and what are you telling the American people at this point? I'm putting pretty much the same people around me, except maybe Mike Pence. 
and I'm giving them the facts. I'm telling them, you know what, here's exactly what's going on. And even though we have imperfect information, here's why I think we're going to be okay. One, we're the most innovative, entrepreneurial, creative country in the world. We have some of the best scientists, and we are working day and night to come up with a therapy and a vaccine for this. And I'm going to keep you updated on what's going on. We just passed this amazing stimulus program. You know, we didn't get off to the best start. I might have done it a little bit differently, but you know what? There's no perfect deals right now. So we're doing our best just to get this in your hands and get this in the hands of business so they don't um, lay you off or furlough you or fire you. And so that's where we are. And every day I'm going to come out here and I'm going to tell you the truth. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to people and I'm going to listen because not all the best ideas come from me. Because again, this is America. This is the land of opportunity. So if there's something you have to say, let your congressman, let your senator know, and we're open to all ideas and we'll go from there. And you feel that he has been truthful or not truthful with the American people? You know, when he sticks to script, he's been somewhat truthful. It's when he goes and freelances and, and tries to, you know, do bail, bail, that brand and image enhancement because he thinks he needs to. You know, there's just moments where you hear him talk and you think, wow, he knows more than I ever expected he did. And then all of a sudden he's talking about the media. He's talking about we have the best tests. He's talking about all these things that don't match up with what he just said in his prepared script. So, you know, I... Sometimes the best thing to say is nothing, but that's just not his style. So we've got elected officials and business leaders and the business, a major business leader wants me to say, okay, now you're secretary of the treasury. And now I'm give, turning over the reins economically. And I'm going to ask this micro and macro, but first macro, what would you do differently? We know that the small business uh, subsidies are very important. And we so know that a lot of time, people. What would I do differently? Yes. Okay. So going back in time, I would have done it very differently. And I even said this to the Treasury Secretary and to Trump for that matter. So they um, called you. They reached out to you. I, I reached out to um, somebody there who connected me. They didn't reach out to me. And so I said, look, the key to making this work, and this was two and a half weeks ago, is reducing the friction and having as much continuity as we possibly can so businesses of any sizes don't have to furlough or fire people. Because once that happens, everybody reevaluates their businesses. And for the people who were let go, they reevaluate their lives and you create a lot of um, disconnections in the economy. So what I would have done is I would have put together an overdraft program because I wanted the small businesses in particular to continue to be able to write checks for all their bills, in particular payroll, utilities, rent, mortgage, and you know a few things on the side. And I would have gone to the banks and I've talked to a few of them. And I said, can you cover these overdrafts for these particular categories? Because you already know these people, they're your customers. You have their, their checking history, right? Their debit history and their credit history for that matter as well. And so if we give you a certain amount of overdraft that you're allowed to extend to these small to medium sized businesses and the Fed makes you whole at the end of every day, because there's a, there's, I forget the exact terminology for it, but there's a limit in overdrafts that banks are allowed to offer um, for a variety of reasons. But if the Fed, but I would have the Fed make them whole at the end of every day. If we had done that, every single business could have just on, kept on paying their bills. Instead, we're, creating all these unique, we're dealing with the symptoms. We're saying, we're gonna forbear mortgages, we're gonna forbear rent, you know, we're gonna push off utilities, when all those are doing is, again, dealing with the symptoms. If we would have just protected overdrafts right from minute one, or again, assuming that we are where we are, if we say, you know what, maybe this doing it through the banks in terms of loans and stimulus is not the best way because they're bankers at heart, and we push on them that to go back to this overdraft approach. If you hire everybody, we'll cover your overdrafts. And then you can, as much as you can, try to go back to normal. If you bring people back, that's what I would do. Well, let me ask you now on the micro level, you've got a very big difference between the Democrats and the Republicans in terms of their bailout ideas, in terms of their stimulus ideas, in terms of how to respond. I don't want to drag you too much into policy but if you look at both approaches, which approach do you think is better specifically for the economy, the Democratic approach or the Republican approach? You know, it, it, you don't know. 
I don't know. We're dealing with imperfect information and you're going to make imperfect decisions. And we have to be candid about that. You know, we, where we are, we're, we're in, this is a Bernie Sanders love fest that he doesn't get to participate in. You know, you know, there, there's um, a professor Galloway. I just was reading this at New York NYU Stern. And he says, um, when business is good, everybody's a capitalist. When business goes south, all those business people become socialists. And effectively, that's what's going on. And so I think we needed to do the stimulus. I think the stimulus is going to get much bigger. But at the same time, once we start to open things back up and get to the other side, we don't really know how this much debt is going to impact. Are we going to see rampant inflation like a lot of people expect? Are we going to see uh, failures in municipalities and you know townships and counties because they forbeared all this tax revenue and just business is so much less that they don't have the tax revenue coming in? There's so much uncertainty that I wouldn't try to take one side at all. I'd basically say, you know what? We're just going to have to be agile and we're going to need people in, in, our, in the political circles to pay attention and just see what the real numbers are and go from there. Okay. How do we pay for it? On the state level, there is no revenue coming in. There's no sales taxes. There's much lower income taxes. On the state level, I live in California. And we already have a 13.3% income tax rate. How much higher are you going to have to kick that? We're going to have to pay for this somehow. How? It's a great question. I don't have the answer, right? That's, this is one of those things where we, this is a complete reset. You can't use dogma from the past. You can't say, well, taxes will incent the economy. You can't say, okay, you know, this is an employee-driven trickle-up environment, even though I think that's where we're leaning. I think you have to say, where are we? when we come out of this, because we've never been in this position before and try to formulate an approach to solving the problem. You know, I, what's it called? NMT that basically says that um, it's the economic theory that says you can just print as much money as you want and it'll all work out in the end. Maybe they're right. You know, maybe they're wrong. Some people will disagree. I, I, I don't. The biggest mistake that anybody can make is to think they have a specific solution and this is the way to do it. At least I don't. Maybe somebody does. Okay, I need to take you to sports because there are a lot of people on here from the sports community. Uh, and I do want to ask you, what is that beverage you're drinking? So this is 100% vodka because that's the only way I can deal with Frank. <laughs> so I get sent all these different products. And so this guy sends this to me and I'm like, what the hell is this? And it's spring water. That's what it says, spring water. And I just happen to have it and I need, it's easy to drink out of, but that's not the interesting thing. I have three kids, 10, 13, and 16, and they think it's so cool because when they go online and talk to their friends, they're sipping this and it looks like they're drinking a beer or something they're not supposed to be drinking. So here I am. I love that idea that you drink liquid death. <laughs> it was free. <laughs> like all How, and it's a very good plug. And by the way, I'm going to ask you about White Castle. It, you know, you did an interview about White Castle. I'm going to ask you about that, but not for a couple minutes. <laughs> So how are we going to fill? You know, I'm a sports fan. Yeah. And I try to get to see everything I can. How are we going to get people? You're an owner. How are you going to get people into the Dallas arena to see your team, whether they play game, whether they have a playoff, uh, which I don't think is likely, but you know more than I do. How are we going to get people to go back to sporting events? So obviously that's a matter of confidence. And so the first step is going to be the, the medical solutions, the science. You know, there has to be something that gives us confidence that we can go out into the wild where there are more than 10 people and not feel threatened. And so that's step one. And once we get examples of that, it may be weddings. It may be going to the park. Who knows where it will be? You know, we, who knows if we'll cover this? But this also relates to airlines and bailouts. And so if I'm an airline, and I'm trying to get money from the feds and I'm negotiating for the feds, one of the things I'm doing representing the taxpayers is saying, look, the, the United States government spends X number of hundreds of millions of dollars um, for commercial airfare in any given year. As part of this bailout, we're, you're gonna give us credit for flights and we're gonna work with you because initially there's not gonna be anybody on your flights anyways. Initially, we're gonna use, better, we're gonna work with you to clean the airplanes and make sure they make, they meet all the specifications and standards that they need to, to, to be safe. And then we'll use our federal employees kind of as the, as the initial group of guinea pigs, if you will, 
um, to go on there and test to give people confidence. And so, you know, having five people on the plane, 10 people, 20, and over time, if all the science and the cleanliness and the sterilization, whatever is required, prevents any cases from occurring, you're going to get a lot more confidence on people flying. And once people get confidence in flying, I think they're going to start to build their confidence to go into other group settings. And so, you know, that's part of the approach that I would take. And then obviously for the American Airlines Center, we're going to have to have standards and we're already working on them where whatever is required to make the place just you know, you're able to eat off of any surface, that's what we're gonna have to do. And we'll have to take it further. You know, we're putting together a labeling system that says, this is when this seat was cleaned and this is what it was used to clean. We'll put together an augmented reality program. So when you point it at a park, at a park bench out front or at the seat you're sitting at, here's the last time it was cleaned, the number of people who have been there, et cetera, et cetera, to provide the information that gives people confidence. So I'm supposed to ask you now, this is the question from the child of one of my, uh, one of my friends and business colleagues. Who's your greatest Shark Tank competitor? I, I'm sorry for asking it, but okay. it's a legit question. People want to know. None. 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 Of these no. Why, why would I think they're competition? No. Have you done better in what you've chosen to invest in? Have you done better than they've done? I think Lori might have, Grenier may have done better because she has a couple of products through QVC that have just exploded. But in terms of overall uh, return, I think I'm as good as her, but she may have done better in total sales. And of all the Shark Tank things that you turned down, is there anyone that you think now, why didn't I make that investment? Not really. I mean, you know, everybody always asks me that question, but the way we work in there is we'll see 12 deals a day and we're just cranking through them over a multi-week period. And so once one is done, I'm looking down at my my phone and doing email. I don't even pay attention. And I couldn't even, unless it's a deal I did, I couldn't name 10% of the deals we've seen. Well, I thank you for not looking down yet. A few more for you. <laughs> Uh, the entertainment industry. I was asked this by a journalist, how are we going to get people back in the theaters? Is Broadway ever going to open again? And more than just giving people confidence, the entertainment industry was already under pressure even before this happened. The movies were not doing as well in the theaters. People were staying home for their entertainment. Nothing is permanent, but is this something that's going to continue for a lot longer than even sports? Yes, um, but I think what will happen, particularly with movie theaters, one, you'll see a reduction in the number of theaters, which will be a great thing for the overall industry. So, you know, there, there's just too many theaters right now. And two, you'll see um, some of the bigger entertainment companies buy up movie theater chains because their market caps, I mean, some of them will declare bankruptcy, I'm guessing. Um, their market caps, um, even with debt, is relatively low. And so it just makes sense to, buy some of them, cut the number of theaters so you, you're able to do theatrical releases for people who want to see them that way. And then because you're vertically integrated, you know, just using this as an example, let's just say Disney buys two chains. Now it's no problem for them to premiere on Disney Plus and to put movies in the theaters. And so I think that's what I, I see happening. In terms of the confidence, they face the same problems that we do with the Mavs at the American Airlines Center, and they're going to have to do the same things. My favorite quote, and I did my research before this interview, and I got to read it, creating opportunities means looking where others are not. Okay, what are you seeing that the rest of us are blind on? Oh, my goodness. You know, you China, one really good business insight. I mean, artificial intelligence coming up with new drugs that deal with the variations and mutations of the coronavirus. You know, that's one of the things I'm looking at, um, trying to, it, with, within the artificial intelligence world, you have big companies that really can invest in AI and know how to use it and use it well, the FANGs as an example, and then you have pretty much everybody else who's not very good at it. So I invested in a company called Node.io, who does, you know, who helps small to medium-sized business um, implement AI, because it's going to be critically important. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of dislocation 
in terms of employees, like I mentioned earlier, and trying to find new types of jobs, again, using AI. How do you, you know, for data scrubbing, for data identification and labeling, there's going to be new ways that we use AI that we that we have to get better at. And that um, I think there's some business opportunities there. So I'm watching the branding of a company like Zoom, which people had not heard of before the pandemic. And now so many people use it that they actually had to change their security. Yep. I've got a Peloton bike. You and I talked about this. I've ordered an Apple Watch because I'm trying to get back healthy again. Are there consumer companies that we might have heard of that are taking particular advantage over what's going on now? Um, that's a great question. I haven't really looked at it that closely. Um, I think Google is doing a good job because they have access to so much data that they're turning into a company that gives us some confidence and where we search for information as opposed to being a company we want to break up. But in terms of consumer products, I haven't really thought about it, Frank. I don't know. Now, people who have, uh, your name has been mentioned for president on occasion, and I'm not going to do that to you here. But there's a question about the half of Americans, and it's increasing, that are living paycheck to paycheck. And they really don't have, as I read to you before, they don't have that extra money saved up. They really can't afford to leave their jobs. They can't afford, they have two weeks savings Great. and they're about to lose that. So now put yourself in the, in the hands of Joe Biden. What would you be telling him to do? He can't speak up. He's not as involved in the conversation. What should Biden do? So number one, you set a federal minimum wage to $15. And as painful as that is for some small companies, as long as everybody's playing by the same rules, it's no different than the cost of a commodity going up. Not to make labor a commodity, but in a lot of respects it is. So that's the key. So number one, $15 minimum wage. Number two, create tax incentives for companies of all sizes to um, offer um, equity as an incentive to employees. I've because that. Because as long as you're getting paid by the hour, you're never going to increase your net worth. You need something, some sort of cap, some sort of asset that um, will appreciate. And so that's number two. Um, golly, what else, Joe? Oh, healthcare. So in terms of healthcare, there's going to be way, a By What's the that? way, if he pauses the way you just did, that's not good for him. It's not a good look, but go ahead. Yeah, that's okay. I'm not him. <laughs> and I have been working on this. It's all at the top of my head. So number three is healthcare. So it's going to be very difficult to get a whole new healthcare program passed. And so within the um, ACA, I would create a self-insurance, um, a government self-insurance program. Effectively, and I've had all the numbers done, as you know, effectively, if you would create a competitive, quote unquote, insurance company that's run by the United States and acts as the insurer, then you can do, create a program where there are no premiums until you actually use the system. And so the numbers work. So dealing with healthcare, that would be important. And you're gonna have to deal with unemployment insurance and you're gonna have to extend that on a federal basis. And so, you know, because of all the uncertainty that's going on here. And then finally, I tell, I tell everybody that there's gotta be an inflection point where we sit down and have a national conversation, almost like JFK used to do where he'd speak up and say, here's where we're at. You know, here's where we need to go. We're going to have a national conversation about where we are and where we need to be and how we're going to get there. Because coming out of this, we're not going to have all the answers. So there's a question that comes from Richard Dreyfus, and he talks about trying to celebrate the end of the virus without appearing to take credit. I don't know how you do that. If you're a Republican, if you voted for Donald Trump, you're going to give him credit. You're going to say that this is the right time to end it. If you're a Democrat, no matter what Trump says, you're going to criticize him. You're a marketing guru. It's more than just an entrepreneur. It's more than just an inventor. How do you market the end of the virus? We the people. I mean, you just you celebrate the joy of what's going on and almost create a new Fourth of July where whether it's fireworks or an event that we all can gather around and celebrate, you know, there's going to be a lot of artists that are going to need work. And so you create concerts. I, I've literally had a conversation 
with Live Nation. And we didn't talk about this specifically, but we talked about all the graduates from this year who haven't been able to have a graduation ceremony. So why not have, if we're done and through this in August or early September, why not have a, a singular graduation day where all these bands across all, you know, play across all these campuses and everybody has a big time party on the same day for all these college kids. You effectively could do the same thing for the nation as well. Create the, you know, what, what was it um, um, from the um, fourth Independence Day, the movie, right? Yep. From this day forward, we declare this our Independence Day, right? You just, the reason why we go and we talk about uh, Republicans and Democrats is because there's a lack of leadership right? It's not about politics. It's about lack of leadership. There's nobody that we know that we can turn to that speaks for us in, in a singular voice that, that represents all the people. That's what's missing. So when, if somebody, whoever that may be, and you've heard me say, you don't have to be the leader to be a leader. But if somebody organizes that day and says, this is the day that will be our new independence from the, whatever we call it, right? That's something people are going to get behind. It could have been the Olympics, you know, imagine how great it would have been rooting for Team USA, you know, as an underdog in various sports if we had gotten past this virus prior to that. But it's not, that's not going to happen. So now it's got to be a leader standing up saying this is, quote unquote, our new Independence Day. We're going to celebrate it and we're not going to lie about the crowds and we're going to enjoy ourselves and put this behind us and move forward as the American people. So I've got uh, a couple of sports questions. We're, we're, I promise I would keep this short. That's okay. I'm enjoying it. Keep them coming. I'm getting inundated. What do you say to – I got two questions. One is for the sports people. I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we're not going to play playoffs and the championship in basketball. Is there still a chance that we will see an end of season in the NBA? Yes, Absolutely. What odds would you give it? I'm guessing 70%. That's pretty good. I, are you talking to your players to make sure that they're staying in shape out of, out of this? They're young. It's easy for them to get in shape. You give them a couple of weeks notice. Because remember, our training camps are only three and a half weeks. And so for us, it's not going to be that difficult. And you play a five game, you know, end of regular season so they can get in game shape because you really can't prepare without really playing the games. And then you go to the playoffs and maybe you make the playoffs five game series, except for the finals or maybe the conference finals and finals. And you probably don't play it in front of fans. You play it just for TV only. And like we talked about earlier, I mean, people will go nuts for it. We need that. We need something to root for. We need something to be fans of. We need something to get excited about. And so I really think if the science allows us to keep people safe, keep our players and all, all of the personnel involved safe, then we have a moral obligation to play. When do you, are you looking at June, July? When do you think this will happen? The day scientifically, you know, Adam Silver and the Board of Governors is told that we really think it's safe and we can do this and here's the course and here's the path um, for us to do it. That's when. Will you be on the sideline? Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> okay, so even though you're not a player, you still get a chance to attend your game. Hopefully, you know, I guess I should qualify that. Maybe I'll have to watch it on TV. Maybe I won't be able to be there. But the goal is obviously to be there. And will you be taking on the refs with the same fervor that you do now? Yeah, they might not be able to hear me through my mask, though, but I will be taking them on. <laughs> there are children of college students of the people who are on this and even a few student, students of mine. Of college students who are okay. And they've lost their internships. Some of them have lost their job offers. It's very late in the process. We're already into April. What do you recommend for them? I teach at NYU Abu Dhabi, and they're great students. How do they not lose half a year of their lives? I mean, they've, they've already lost a big chunk, I guess, um, relatively speaking. But, you know, the idea of an internship is to learn. The idea even of your first job is to learn. And learning is always an opportunity. And knowing, learning how to learn is always a skill set that you can improve on. And so like with my kids, myself, right, being stuck here, going on Coursera and taking these classes so that, you know, an artificial intelligence 
you know, so that I can get smarter about reading, whatever it may be, participating in remote discussions um, related to specific topics. This is actually an opportunity. So if you have any type of diligence, any type of discipline for, for them to go out and start taking these classes so that they're better prepared and they're going to be able to walk in because one of the first questions every potential um, employer is going to ask you is, what did you do during the pandemic of 2020? Did you know, is a great, I got great at NBA 2K. My Fortnite game went through the roof, you know, Overwatch. I, I thought I might have a chance to go pro or I took these three Coursera classes and now I'm great at this. My, I didn't know how to program in Python. Now I do. Now I can sit down and talk to your data scientist about data labeling for neural networks or even GANs or RCNs, whatever it may be, because I recognize that this was an opportunity for me to get ahead. Even though in an internship, that first job traditionally, you know, makes a lot of sense, having this time, particularly if you're younger, you're, it's pretty much all time, then this is your opportunity. This is your chance to get an edge. Use it wisely, wisely grasshoppers. <laughs> okay, that's brilliant. That's like, that advice is worth the whole chat. Now for the rest of us, for boomers. All, the, all my other advice has been horse manure, right? But I got no. one good answer. No, but that that is really, really good because that is an interview question you're going to get. That is a great answer you've given. Them. And if they don't respond that way, I'm going to kill them. Yeah. But for, <laughs> for everybody else, and this is really emotional because my parents aren't around anymore. I don't know if yours are. But you said that the two best sentences you ever got in your life, and I want to read it correctly, today is the youngest you will ever be, live like it. How do we do that when we have engagements like you and I here, but you you stopped over a month ago. I don't have that human interaction anymore. People were wonderful to me, but now we gotta do it virtually. How do you live like this is the youngest you're ever gonna be? Because you have, literally you have to live young. If you watch kids, if you talk to 13, 10, 13, 16, 18, 25 year olds, this is exactly how they live. You know, this is your chance to be young. This is your chance, you know, to to really pick up on, you know, the the culture of, of younger people. My kids could be sitting next to each other and they'll text each other. You know, they could be, you know, six feet away and they'll FaceTime each other. And, you know, listening to their music, things that I might not otherwise do. It's it's an opportunity, and yeah, it's different. But you know, we all go through these cultural changes and challenges. That there's always generational differences, and and if anything, this may have closed some of the generational differences. And you know what? We're resilient. You know, we we like to hug, and we will hug a whole lot when we get out of this. But in the meantime, we can connect, we can talk, and we have time to do it. And I think people will connect even, potentially even more closely now because they have the time. You know, in the past, oh, if I only had the time, I would call Frank. If only I had the time, I would call this person or that person. I'm having hangout chats with my high school buddies like once a week now. I mean, that's more than we've talked to each other. Well, like we email back and forth once or twice a week. But now we get to actually see and yuck it up and act like we're 16 years old again. And that never would have happened otherwise. So wherever there's change, there's opportunity. So I want to ask you, and we'll do two more and then I'll stop because your time is precious. My doctor is on this uh, group chat. What's up, Doc? And, and he, I credit him. I, I have three medical professionals that genuinely saved my life, and I'm so grateful. You donated a significant amount to the children of first responders, of medical first responders, and the Mavericks, and this is something you've been involved in. We have a lot of very successful people on this call. If they want to make a difference, a meaningful difference, a measurable difference, what would you tell them to do in their communities? Just do it. You got you where you are of being successful by being smart. Do what you think is the smart thing to do. You know, I always look for impact points. Who's in the most pain? Who needs, who needs something the most and can I provide it? And if I can, that's what I do. I rarely, rarely go through charities. I'm never going to give money to the Red Cross or somebody big and no disrespect to anybody who supports them just because there's too, too big and they're too big and too much overhead. 
I mean, I'll pay for someone's heart transplant. I'll pay for their kidney transplant. I'll, you know, pay for the, the daycare for healthcare workers who are on the front lines right now, because that's an immediate impact right now. It doesn't have to go through a committee. You know, those are things I know can change people's lives with in, in a, on a friction, in a friction free basis. And so, you know, whatever's important to you, whatever you think has the greatest impact, do it. Well, I did my donation to UCLA hospital because they have been so important in my recovery. And if anybody, this is the last question. So if you want to make a comment, uh, please do right now. You made a statement that I thought was very funny. One of my favorite films of all time is Diner. And I love the test that the actor <laughs> put his wife through. And you did something similar. And you're not sitting in front of that sign no, now. Right. Oh, my God. Yeah. So when my wife, Tiffany, and I were dating, we were taking a walk in New York. And I'm like, I'm going to give you the test. And she's like, what's the test? So I literally made her walk like three miles to a White Castle in New York City and made her eat a White Castle slider. And she passed. She's never eaten one since, and that was 20 years ago, but she passed the test. Well, they come and I do a lot of fundraisers here at my home, and they have been gracious donors, and I just love hearing that. Mark, you're a special guy, and people respect you for what you do in sports. They respect you for Shark Tank. They respect you for a business acumen that is wonderful. But I say this to everyone on here. You have been so kind to me. We have dined together. You have sent me incredible memes. And I have sent you stuff that I could get into all sorts of trouble over. You really are a special guy. Is there any closing word you want to you wanna say? We've got members of Congress. We've got senators on here. We've got CEOs on here. And we've got my friends on here. <laughs> no, you know what? everything's different now. You know, now this is the ultimate reset. You know, we all go through life, our lives thinking, if only I had the time, if only this would change or only this door would open for me to do something a little bit differently. Now's the time. And I think party politics should be different. But if you're a politician, here's your chance to make them different. We're, you know, we're in a scenario where there's a dearth of leadership. Stand up and be a leader. Don't feel, feel like you have to fit in. Do what you know is right. What's the worst thing that can happen? You know, on Shark Tank, Damon John calls it the power of broke. Typically, the best businesses are started when somebody has nothing. And right now, this, this country has so much, but leadership politically, it's all a reset. And here's a chance to change the game. Why not you? And that's what I'll leave it with. When you have that idea, when you have that goal, when you have that vision of what America 2.0 will look like, after this reset, and you're thinking through it, just ask yourself, why not me? And I'll tell you, why not you? Mark, I am forever in your debt. And for those still on, which is 155 out of 161, that ain't bad. <laughs> Next Friday evening, we're going to have Mike Milken is going to join this chat. Oh, cool. Mark, um, I cannot thank you enough. Everybody, we are done. Thank and you, Frank. And I'm grateful. I owe you. Never. Never. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.